Hello, everybody. Welcome to this week's uh, webinar or Pilates Hour. Uh, it's another uh, another takeover. Uh, Shelly does the uh, Pilates Hour. So Brent is teaching the rheumatology course right now, and so I offered to fill in. Thank you for everybody that joined last week. We had a good time looking at the parakeet and how to make it a little easier, what to expect from it. Monica did a great job um, as my as my demonstrator. And um, this week we're gonna talk about stenosis. Lots of times I get questions, I get questions about exercises. How do you do this exercise or that exercise? Uh, and then sometimes how do you do it with this particular population? And then even that next step of, I just don't know that I even understand this pathology or diagnosis well enough to work with people. And I think that's a really important um, a really important piece that we have to make sure that we are working in our own scope of practice, our own training. And um, I think most people really do. And it's easy sometimes to push those limits, but there, you know, we really need to be respectful of um, how much we know, how long we've been practicing, how long we've been doing what we do, whether it's medicine, physical therapy, Pilates, uh, and and just being really respectful of that of that boundary of of, of feeling confident and being well trained um, to to work with somebody with something like stenosis because it is such a common <laughs> um, thing. It is something that pretty much probably all of us will um, develop. And I think it's just the natural part of aging where the openings, where the you know either the central canal or the foramina. Um, where the nerve, the spinal cord, and the nerves that leave the spinal cord, um, those openings start to get a little bit, um, start to get a little bit um, smaller. We talk about, you know, the what's needed um, in Pulsar a lot. I think the what not to do is what people focus on, which is also really important. If someone came into you and said, oh, I have spinal stenosis, um, making sure you know that they're talking about spinal stenosis and maybe not um, you know, an artery or something, right? So you can have narrowing, um, and that's just what the word means. You could have narrowing anywhere, right, of, of anything. And so we're specifically talking about the spine. And so when someone does come in and say, oh, I have stenosis, one of the things that I'm thinking about is wherever they have it, and hopefully you're finding out, do they have it in their cervical spine or cervical spine or in their lumbar spine, is... Um, I'm not thinking, oh, right away I'm going to do <laughs> extension with this person. But what I am thinking of is what do they need? What specifically for their body do they need? And in general, what do most people need who have stenosis? And since it is something that is irritated by extension, quite often what you'll see people, their posture will change a little bit and they'll go from standing upright with their normal lordotic curve to starting to slowly over time adopt a posture where their lumbar spine gets a little more lengthened because that's more comfortable. We're pretty smart about finding, you know, finding comfort. Unfortunately, sometimes that's at the risk of not continuing to do things, positive things for our posture. So that's just one way to do it to get out of pain. But what can we do and what's needed for somebody that has stenosis? So if you've listened to any poll star, anything, <laughs> a course, a webinar, continuing education, um, just had a chat with Brent or probably any poll star educator, you hear about spine mobility and hip mobility. I think everybody needs those, right? We are just more sedentary than we used to be. And we sit a lot more than we used to. So we have pretty poor spine mobility in all directions. And we tend to move where we have the greatest range of motion. So if I'm going to turn around and look behind me to make sure I got my props, I can turn my head quite far. And I don't really move my body much at all. Shoulder comes around a little bit. But my head and my neck have a lot of mobility. I also have a lot of mobility in my lumbar spine moving into extension. 
Um, it's just it's it's in the in the shape that the spine normally goes in. So we tend to move in those places like water, right? We go to the path of least resistance. So if it's if I don't have to do much work and I can just turn and look over my shoulder, I'm going to do that instead of involving my whole torso and all the segments. So for this population, um, we really need to be working on thoracic extension, but also rotation and side bending as long as it doesn't irritate um, their low back or their neck, because those are the two places where you're most commonly going to have stenosis or this narrowing. And so as we're looking at that, I think we need to kind of bring the, the edges of where we think this movement should go in a little bit. In terms of in terms of spinal mobility, so we think of something like a swan as this gigantic back arch, and there is um, you know some extension there. But quite often, what we see is thoracic phase flat or flex, and we tend to hinge in the low back and go into extension there. So we want to make sure that we're really getting into thoracic extension, and we'll show a couple of things in a little bit. Um, in all the work that you're doing. And don't forget about the other two motions. So you need to, you know, we probably don't need to work on flexion very much as gaining a lot more range of motion. Thinking of this population where it's happening in older adults, they might have some degree of bone loss, maybe they have osteopenia or osteoporosis, and we don't need to work so much into flexion but we do need to work into side bending and rotation. So those are the things that we want to focus on in the spine. And we also want to work on our hip mobility. And this is where I said in the, uh, um, in one of the promo pieces of, you know, can we extend, you know, people, can we work on extension with people with stenosis? Absolutely. And sometimes for people, depending on the degree of the narrowing and their symptoms, their hip extension might actually just be less hip flexion. It's totally possible that we may be looking and working with somebody who's never really probably going to get their hip even into neutral because maybe they don't have the control at their lumbar spine to be able to maintain a comfortable position there and get their leg and their hip into really get it into extension. So they might get to neutral, they might get to extension, and they might just be in less flexion. And I think that's something important to remember that, that that's okay, that it's a work in progress. And especially as we're older, the body doesn't adapt as quickly to change, right? It's still going to change, but it might take a little bit, a little bit longer. And it's tough because people have discomfort and they just go into a little bit of lumbar instead of thoracic or hip extension, and then it's irritated and they're not happy. And so, you know, it, it's, it's a slow moving amount of progress that we can, that we can make with some people, others, we can get it a lot more, um, a lot more quickly. And then one of the things, and I actually, before I jumped on here today, I was just looking online, just quickly doing a, a little Google search of Pilates and stenosis. And I saw a couple of different things that came up, nothing out of PubMed, not a, not a research um, study or anything, but just, you know, how to work with somebody with stenosis. And I just thought that there was too much, as you know, um, we, we don't want to always focus on stability because a lot of times that just means getting all of your muscles to fire and being a little bit rigid, which in any little split second could be okay. Right. If you needed to brace or do something, that's OK, but that's not how you want to live your life. And it's certainly not how you want to organize your body to move. So what I was seeing a lack of was this idea of awareness. And we often aren't aware because we just haven't had to be, especially if I'm just sitting in my chair all day long. I don't need a lot of awareness, but now I want to get up and walk or maybe now I have a grandchild and I want to play with them. And all of a sudden, I'm having all of this back discomfort because I'm in a position that's not really ideal for me, and I don't really know what to do about it or how to get out of that position. So being able to give people more options for where they're moving, you've heard us say for years and years and years, probably since the very 
uh, beginning this idea of distribution of movement and distribution of force. Sometimes, and I actually don't have one with me right now, but I'll take a credit card or a room key from a hotel and I'll hold it up tall and I'll just start to move the edges of it and it bends and lengthens and bends and lengthens and it goes right back to its original starting position every time. Unless I start to bend it so much that I get the white line down the middle. And now that's the point of least resistance. So if I go again to, to move that um, card, it now just bends in the center because that place has more available motion than the rest of it. And if you look at the two edges of it, they don't bend at all. And that's kind of this idea of, you know, what are we, where are we moving and what are we doing where we can distribute the movement over the whole length of the spine, including the hip joints and potentially even the shoulders? Um, or are we just hinging and moving at the same place all of the time? And so in a real easy way to not irritate the lumbar spine, if there's stenosis there, we just say, well, just don't do extension. And then we kind of just work in flexion. And, and I feel like we're missing for a, a lot of people, the ability to actually really improve their posture and their awareness. So that's really something that to me is, is important. Um, and if there's probably one takeaway, that would, <laughs> that would be it. All right. So I've mentioned a lot of these things. Um, you know, we have we have over mobility in some places, lack of mobility in other places, and I think we're not always using the equipment to the best that we can, um, using our cueing, things like that. So just thinking about um, getting a little bit more responsiveness in the body and how we can position ourselves to move a little bit more, more comfortably. So one of the things that, and this is super common, this I've not, I've certainly not made this up, um, but looking at doing some thoracic extension with a ball or something behind um, the upper back. And what's important is not so much being in this position of stretching over the ball, but how do you get into it so that the person doesn't accidentally go into extension as they're doing it. I'll show you this in a, in, um, a moment. We'll look at this um, on the chair. So as you're in the position, you know, you can be helping people with the ball. And I'm being mindful to allow my pelvis, and this is how you're going to communicate to your clients, allow the pelvis to be lengthened away and the lumbar spine to be kind of flattened or even curved a little bit, the softer the surface you're on, the better, uh, because your body will just kind of, you know, melt into that and be cradled almost. And then you can work at going into some little amounts of extension. This is a Yamada ball, so it's a little bit thicker material and heavier, and it supports me better. Um, but anything that's soft here, and again, it's not this, we do this all the time over the ladder barrel, over the spine corrector, but where can we find a place where my lumbar spine can be biased out of extension? I don't want to always say bias to flexion because some people don't need that much, but where can that happen so that I can work on moving my upper body without at the same time arching my lower back? So that's one of the things. And I think it's also really important when we're in those positions is to be mindful of, are we talking about engaging the muscles a lot? So if I'm going to protect my back, it's probably one of the things that I use that I dislike the most of, you're going to do something to protect the back. Think what that might mean to somebody who's had an injury or maybe not even a spinal injury. Maybe they had an old shoulder injury or ankle or knee. And you're going to do something to protect the body. And, and we do it with good intention, but it might create some fear, some fear of moving or fear of this particular movement or setup or piece of equipment. So be careful, be mindful if you're going to say something like that. And is it really useful in the moment? So if I tighten my muscles a lot to protect my back, 
the place that I will end up having movement because my abdominal muscles now are concentrically pulling me into flexion, which is okay, except when I go to extend, probably I'm going to move again at that point of most uh, most movement, which is right around the area that I have the stenotic segments that are uncomfortable in extension. So change maybe your cueing or think about how you're cueing these things to allow the body to be in a shape as opposed to use the muscles to move it into a shape. And I think you might get a little bit more um, out of it and you can get into the positions a little bit more, more comfortably. So just a thought on that and all the different um, places that we do that. One of the other movements, and feel free to um, stand up and give this a go. It's, uh, it's, I teach this quite often, so you might have felt this before and worked on this before. But this idea of conditioning the hip muscles, and this I take from Juan and Blas and all the Renity work that we've done, of how we can start to get people to understand a more hip neutral position. So the feeling that the thigh is pushing back, and this is where the awareness is really important because if I really don't have the awareness of how to get my hip flexors to lengthen a little bit, or at least be um, less concentrically contracted, right? I'm going to not be able to get into hip neutral or closer to hip neutral, maybe without sending my spine into extension. So just having the sense of pushing back into your fingers. And sometimes I will use a band, I'll take a TheraBand and wrap it from the back or from the front and just start getting people used to pushing back into their fingers, but without changing the spine alignment. And so that's one of the things that we can talk about because one of the places that my clients often talk to me about having the most discomfort is standing around at a cocktail party, standing around at a meeting or a conference, standing in line at the grocery store. And these are things that they all need to be able to do. So are there some little things that you can get them in that moment? I'm standing at the grocery store. I don't have my cart to lean on or I only have one little thing in my hand. Um, that's the, you know, that's the idea. Um, of this pushing back feeling. So give that a go and see how that um, see how that feels. So as I mentioned, just and this is something that most people know, is the idea of the narrowings. We talked about that. And just getting my camera down just a smidge. Um, and it could be again the central canal, they might have a central stenosis. Or they might have, a, you know, the area where the nerves pass outward, that might be a little bit narrowed. And then when we extend, just normally when you extend, if you watch the spinal segments, those little openings or foramina, they close a little bit already. So if there have been any kind of little bone spurs or sometimes there's some calcification, Maybe you've had um, just some normal degeneration in the disc that can start to cause a little bit of a stenosis. It happens from a lot of different reasons. Um, that's that's really what we're what we're looking at, and that's why extension is bothersome because it's it's adding a little bit of insult to injury there. So I thought it would be interesting for us to look at uh, the screening and. What are we going to do with our full star screening? Because that's something that we do often, and it has a lot of potential to put somebody into lumbar extension. So, just in the chat, if you're familiar with the full star screening, what might be some screening tests that you would like to look at to see where somebody has mobility or notice where they're having a little bit of a lack of mobility? And how would you modify it? So let's just put it in the chat. I didn't make a menti, um, a menti slide today. Just put that in the chat. So what would be some full star screening tests for that? Great. So I'm seeing goalposts. And when you do, when you enter into the chat, if you can change the little drop down to include everybody, then everybody can see the chat and see all of your answers. I'm also going to read them all off. But um, love to see what you're thinking about. 
So Elizabeth wrote in about goalposts and ooh, Superman. Yeah, good. Lisa, Lisa put in Superman. Long sit, okay. Squat and goalpost. Yeah, we're seeing some themes here. Good. So let's look at the let's look at the goalpost and what do we know about it? Well, one of the things as we're standing against the wall, getting ready to put the arms up or to reach all the way overhead, is can they actually get their spine to move? So sometimes in the in the screening of the goalpost. We see so much focus on the shoulder that we lose a little bit sometimes the idea that it could be the spine that is limiting the arms to come back. So one of the things that I look like, look, I don't look like, I look at when I'm in this position, I'll just hold my arm a little bit forward so I'm not blocking the camera, is not so much their relationship to the wall. We understand that probably somebody is going to be a little bit rounded forward, potentially, and I can encourage them to get taller, but I not, might not be able to get them taller. So what I'm really looking at, if I want to assess what's happening at their shoulder, is what is their relationship of their arm to their torso, not their body and their arm and their torso to the wall. So that's very helpful. Um, also for somebody who has osteoporosis, they may actually have pretty good shoulder mobility, but it's appearing as they don't because their spine is a little bit rounded. So see if you can take those two pieces and separate them a little bit and start to understand, is it a lack of mobility in the spine or is it really that they have a limitation in their shoulder? because that's something important to address so that every time they reach overhead to grab something, they're not inadvertently getting their arm up by going into extension, because that would be, again, that path of least resistance into the lumbar spine. So just check that out and see, um, see how that goes for the, um, for the goalpost. You can also assess in goalposts because they're gonna be standing up against the wall, you can see what is their natural uh, position as they put their pelvis against the wall. And like I said, if somebody's had stenosis for a while, they're pretty smart. They've figured out that to stand with the lumbar spine lengthened is actually a little more comfortable. What we want to do, maybe we don't change this. Maybe this isn't possible um, to make a change in this part, but we can start to look at can we widen the sit bones just a little bit in the sense of tucking and make sure the buttocks muscles are not pulling us into this position and then be able to stand a little bit taller. So that's something I'm gonna look at as they're standing against the wall. Are they adopting this posture or do they understand maybe they could come out of it just a little bit um, to have a little bit more ease around the, around the thigh? All right. Good. So going on, I see a couple of others in there. Oh, I want to look at, yes, yeah, Superman <laughs> for um, what Lisa um, put in. So we have Superman, we have prone press up, and we have prone shoulder flexion. So in all of those, we have, unfortunately, <laughs> a prone body, right? So we're being pushed toward extension a little bit in um, the position just simply because we're lying on the floor. So we wanna make sure that we can test that. So one of the things that we do is test them supine. So I can look at prone shoulder flexion in supine and see how far the arms go over. That's a really important piece to this, um, to this puzzle. I can also look at prone press up in other different positions. So one of the ones that I like to do is to do it in sitting. And so as I'm sitting, let's see if this is a good angle. As I'm sitting, I could adopt just a little bit, again, of a rollback and very, very careful not to be tucking under. I don't want my pelvis to be moving forward this way. I wanna have my pelvis just roll back a little bit behind the sit bones to create a position that's comfortable without a lot of muscular effort. And then I can lean forward a little bit and place my forearms down, or if 
maybe a counter is a better height or a desk. I can put my arms on that and start to look at, can I get my upper spine to come out of flexion? And just like the hip, we may not get to extension, especially if the lower part of the spine is already biased toward flexion. I may not be able to get into extension, but I can certainly see if somebody has some ability to move. And I know because they're in this position already that they're not going to accidentally do that instead. It's a little bit harder to do that. It's not as kind of the, the natural thing that somebody would choose. Getting here, I can start to have that and I can pull on the knees. I can pull on the surface. If I have my arms on a table or something, I could pull there and start to get a little bit more motion in my upper back. And I do it that way rather than quadruped for that reason. When people are in quadruped, going into lumbar extension is, it's almost like they can't do anything else. They know that movement pattern. And so we're not as, um, we're not as successful with that if somebody has quite a bit of um, discomfort uh, and quite a lack of mobility. So this is one of the ways that I will look at it just in sitting. Um, not the only way, but it is one way that I like to um, I like to do that. And then the hip extension piece again, just in standing, I will do a little bit of the um, pushing the thigh back. And I've been playing a little bit with um, well, actually, I I started doing this with Sherry uh, Betts years ago. Brent credits me with it, but I actually learned it from from Sherry which is to lie prone, not for this population, but just for getting into hip extension, lie prone, I can show it, turn the toes under, and instead of just having somebody lift their leg here, and maybe they lift their knee, or they rotate, or they extend, if you turn the toes under and straighten the leg, you can get the hip and buttocks muscles to engage without so much risk of going into extension. You have to kind of get everything to co-contract. So I've been playing with this. This might not work for somebody with stenosis. So I've been playing with it in standing with just the foot a little bit back and just starting to press the thigh back a little bit, maybe against the fingers and starting to feel how that can change without the body changing. So I've been playing with that a little bit with some clients. Um, and they're starting to understand a little bit better where the movement um, is coming from. Now the squat, yes, I'm super interested in the squat and maybe for a different reason than you, <laughs> those of you that put it in. I do wanna see, oh. <laughs> well, sorry, I'm sorry about that Siri that you don't understand me. <laughs> she speaks up at the most inconvenient times. So when we're doing the squat, often we're looking at hip flexion, we're looking at ankle dorsiflexion, we wanna see people's balance and their leg strength, which is really important for this population. But I'm also looking at just the idea of letting the buttocks muscles and the pelvic floor muscles lengthen. So the bone rhythms around the squat are really important. So we're getting some of the pelvic tissues and the hip tissues to be able to lengthen, to allow the squat to go down. And if you ha aren't familiar with the bone rhythms or you're um, unsure about how they are, just we can quickly go through them. It's really helpful when squatting. It's helpful when getting up and down out of a chair, um, any of the things that we have to do just in our normal life. So the idea that as you're bending, as you're going into hip flexion, there's a sense of the half of the pelvis on each side going around. And for a long time, and pardon my back to you, uh, for a long time, I used to cue it from underneath, which is still effective, um, almost like the sit bones are smiling. But really the idea is that the pelvis is coming out this way. And so at some point, the two halves of the pelvis are actually gonna come together in the front at the pubic bones. And so for some people, the idea of the pubic bones coming together is just as effective as the sit bones or the halves of the pelvis widening in the back. And at the same time, the femur is spiraling out. 
So that is really important. And if you can get people to do that more and more as they're sitting in their chair, um, going to sit in a chair and get back up, um, that is really helpful because we've got the muscles moving and hopefully they're gonna come out of this holding and muscle guarding pattern and continue to have some, some life and some movement. All right. Good, let me look at my notes really quick, see if I had any others there for the screening. Um, I'm also looking a bit at the heel ring. So again, I wanna know somebody's strategy in standing since that is a place where people have a lot of discomfort. They start to get the buttocks pain and the pain radiating down the back of the leg and some of the pins and needles feeling um, and the discomfort that comes with standing. So I want to be able to look at how they do with their heel raise. Depending on the person, I might do um, a single leg and I might not. I might just be looking at the double heel raise and standing to give them, again, some idea of how they're moving. And this is something that I can relate back to then when we're doing things like footwork. So in footwork, we talk a lot about, or I at least want a lot of the feet getting down lower and the bar getting down lower. But for this population, we might not be able to, they might not have the control of their torso so much, yet we can still work on them engaging the back of their thigh and pressing the thigh backward, even if the feet are higher and the hip is a little bit flexed. So just some places where we can tie those, tie those pieces together. Um, which can give us some, you know, some help with our session. Um, prone knee bend I saw, good. Swan we talked about, um, modified prone press up. Um, yeah, and Kelly, Kelly just brought up the, the prone press up or the modified prone press up and making sure that the pubic bone stays engaged to the mat. And that's something really important. And I talk about this when I'm teaching any swan to anybody is again, thinking about our cueing of, do we keep the pelvis tucked under a little bit when we're doing that, or do we let the pelvis move toward as much neutral as the person can do? I would say, please, 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 when you're teaching any kind of the prone press up, that you allow the pelvis to be flat. And just like when I was sitting and talking about rolling back and having a lot of tension to go into extension over the ball, or just allowing the pelvis and the tissues to be elongated, you're probably going to get closer to having people be able to do things comfortably prone if maybe you prop up the abdomen. And we, we do talk about this. I hear people say, oh, well, this person has stenosis. When they're lying prone, I'm going to put a pad or a cushion or something under their abdomen. And that's a great strategy. I just wonder, do people understand why that's helpful? Why is that a good, why is that a good strategy? So what you're allowing for is the lumbar spine to be in its more lengthened position, its more comfortable position, but you're not doing it by engaging the trunk flexor. Because if you're engaging the abdominal muscles in flexion, to protect the low back and keep the pubic bone down, then most likely when somebody goes into extension, you have the rectus abdominis especially is preventing extension, right? And you already have them working so many muscles that you decrease the places where they will have movement. So when you're propping somebody with a towel or a cushion, think about that of creating ease in the lower part of the body, you're mechanically holding their pelvis and their spine in that position and allowing the pelvis to kind of almost not drop down, but have again that sense of length. And then they're able to go into the prone press up, similar to what I was showing sitting with my forearms on my knees. So you might get a little bit more um, out of that with people because. People with stenosis come to reformer classes, they come to mat classes, and undoubtedly we're going to do exercises that put us in prone, in extension potentially. Um, one of the reformer exercises that we do often with this population is either pulling straps if they're a little bit more progressed, or lying on the long box with their hands on the foot bar of the reformer 
doing some overhead press and going into extension. And we need to set the body up so that it's comfortable, right? We don't want to put them in a position of, of discomfort. So just be thinking of that as you're doing some of those exercises um, and you know how you can create length without a lot of muscular tension. And I see, um, I didn't mention this in the beginning um, and it's totally fine. I, I can see the chat quite easily, um, but there's a question in the chat by Jules um, asking of, um, does the discussion change depending on where the stenosis is? Absolutely. And again, the two main places that we see it is in the cervical or cervical spine and in the lumbar spine. So if for some reason somebody has changes more in their neck and not so much in their lumbar spine, then a lot of this that we're talking about really just doesn't, it doesn't apply so much um, because the lumbar spine is going to be functioning and acting well. They tend to often happen together. And the one that is a little bit harder to control just because of moving around and ambulating and climbing and lifting and things like that is often the lumbar. Um, but the same conversation does happen around thoracic mobility. Because if you do start to see somebody, and we see this when people have a hyperkyphosis or if they have um, osteoporosis that's causing that or just some other um, form of kyphosis that they can't come out of, their only option to be able to see and look around is to go into extension in the cervical or cervical spine. And then they're gonna have a lot of problem. And I just was in Miami last week and saw um, a very, um, very aged <laughs> woman and she was walking down the street and she was com almost completely flexed forward. And she was at a point where her head was trying to come up and I just thought, oh my gosh, how is that for her to be able to, she has to see where she's going, um, but that was her only option because she didn't have this mobility. So we want to preserve it as much as possible. We want to get people moving before they might get to a point where they have more of a fixed posture. So starting at, you know, when babies, <laughs> we want to start and continue um, to get kids moving keep them out of sitting in chairs for long periods of time. You guys, if you've been sitting for a long period of time, get up and move around um, because we really want to maintain the mobility that we have. And it's much easier to maintain it than it is to try to re rebuild it. Um, it takes a lot more for that. So yeah, so that's absolutely, um, absolutely true. There's a couple other things. Uh, Kathleen had a suggestion. She says, I use my pelvic rocker to teach them to avoid gripping, yeah, um, sitting or standing. And that's just a nice thing to do really for anybody. If you've taken a course with me, you know that I teach the roll down series, whether it's um, a seated roll down on the reformer or a roll down on the mat or the trap table. Um, I'm lobbying to change the name to not roll down, but to roll back. And I'm assuming um, that you mean sitting something like this, being able to rock forward and back. In fact, everybody, wherever you are sitting, um, in a chair, hopefully, because it's a little bit easier than if you're on a mat with your legs out in front of you, but in your chair, can you roll in front of your sit bones? I'm taking away a little bit now the stenosis piece, but just as a, as a check-in in your own body, can you move back and forth a little bit behind and in front of your sit bones? without moving the top of your head. How many of you can do that? Um, I can't see you all, but hopefully you're giving a thumbs up on that. That's, that's a very important, important motion that we need to have, which is a combination of hip joint mobility and lumbar spine mobility, not only of the spine, but all of the soft tissue. We should have a few degrees this way and a few degrees this way that we can move without getting shorter, collapsing, or allowing our body to move back and forth. So prior to somebody coming in with these symptoms, um, if we can keep people moving well, then they're going to have fewer symptoms and more options to move where they stay, um, where they stay comfortable. So let me show you see here. Susan asked about a small, um, <laughs> a small pattern of the belly that was well-timed. Yeah. So that is it. And I think of, and um, her, the rest of her question was um, to allow the pelvis to posteriorly tilt. 
That's correct. It is posteriorly tilting, but think about lumbar length and just how we change just, you know, one word of what we're thinking about. If we're thinking about lumbar length versus a posterior tilt, even though they happen together, sometimes you'll get a little different result. So I've been using, um, I've been using a little bit more of the lumbar length um, cues and ideas. All right, let's see what else there is. Um, Debbie is asking about clients who have stenosis and pain and rotation. So, yeah, so one of the things, of course, in the beginning, we're going to limit range of motion. But one of the things we want to work on is getting, really getting movement up in the thoracic spine and rotation. And if we think about it, if the thoracic spine is quite rigid, and then we ask somebody to rotate, all of these ribs and vertebra are not actually moving to each other. There's no movement here. I'm just moving in space and I'm rotating. And this, again, this bit of rotation, rotation can often go with extension. And I might be narrowing those openings further and irritating um, the nerve there. So yeah, so I'm really thinking about how to move the ribs and then move them in opposition. So as you're sitting there, thank you for this question, Debbie. And as we're doing exercises like book opening, right? Lying on the side and going into book opening. We want to be mindful that there is a counter rotation. So as I'm rotating my upper ribs around to my right, I can be thinking of a counter rotation of my lower ribs to the left. And just see how that feels. And I often have clients use their own hands, especially now um, when we're on Zoom or other video um, means with clients when we're seeing people, is have them use their own hands. So feel what it's like to rotate, because not if you have stenosis and this is bothersome, but if it doesn't bother you, see what it's like to rotate everything to one side. So I'm gonna go everything to the right. And I don't really feel any discomfort. Um, I don't really feel any comfort either. Now do it where you rotate to the right up above, but rotate to the left down below. Hopefully, and sometimes it takes a little bit of practice, but hopefully you felt more movement and less stress. Brent refers to this as the rule of ribs. I often will bring out my slinky or I'll use my jaw, um, my water bottle and the jar analogy of turning two surfaces in opposite directions. We should do it to the other side too. Um, and you get more movement distributed through the vertebra, through the ribs, and hopefully it's a little bit more comfortable. So that's what I would do as opposed to just feeling like I engage a lot of muscles to stop this from moving. It's not really moving. I don't know if you can, when you see if I move my hands, my, my ribs aren't down here, aren't going anywhere, but I feel like there's still movement happening as opposed to being rigid and holding and then trying to turn. And then probably I'm either gonna get it in my neck or my low, my low back. So thank you for that, Debbie. I hope you felt um, some difference with that. You can also, if you're doing things like book opening, is just put something behind the lower back, maybe um, the ball, like this, the ball that I was stretching over, or a foam roller, or a towel, or a blanket, and put something where they don't go all the way back. Um, if you have big, soft bolsters, those are quite nice, and you can limit the range of motion. And I would also limit the range of motion at the shoulder. So I like to teach book opening where my hands are behind my head, because I know the weight of this arm is not gonna be pulling me back and potentially putting me in the extension um, piece to it. So that's where we wanna be, okay? All right, let's see what else there is. All right, a couple of people talking about not moving the head. Good, 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 good. Um, Glad that that um, was helpful. Uh, and again, that's really looking not just at spine mobility, but also at hip joint mobility, something important. All right, so Susan is asking about using the breath while sending the breath um, 
and subsequently, subsequently finding space in compressed areas. Absolutely, the breath is so powerful. Any place that you can use the breath to move the ribs, to move all the tissue, it's absolutely crucial. And again, if we're thinking about somebody, again, who has osteoporosis or has some sort of fixed kyphosis, has stenosis to the point where they have now adopted this shape, we've really restricted the diaphragm from moving. And so if the diaphragm isn't moving well, and then we're not asking the spine to move, the breath can really significantly be impacted by this shortened body position. So encouraging the breath to happen in different places. And this is also why I don't want to have too much abdominal muscle contraction, because that also will stop the diaphragm from moving and probably is stopping the diaphragm pelvic floor normal rhythm that happens. That's probably also being impacted by this. So, you know, you can think about that as well. But yes, use the breath, use the breath, use the breath. <laughs> really important. All right, Gemma is asking, um, would you recommend neck rotation movement for cervical stenosis? Um, I would, it would depend on the person. Um, oh, when, oh, sorry, I didn't see the end of the question. So would you recommend um, neck rotation movement for cervical stenosis when the neck extension provokes dizziness? No, and I would definitely get that um, checked out by someone. Um, to make sure there's not something wrong with the vertebral artery or something like that. Anytime you're getting movement with a change in state, dizziness, um, that kind of woozy feeling, that's definitely something you want to refer out to make sure that um, something else isn't compromised or something else isn't happening. So, um, yeah, that's something I would um, that I would probably not do with that. Um, anytime you're having that type of dizziness, um, just movement in general it could be blood pressure, could be a lot of things. So just get that, um, get that checked out. All right, Betty is asking. All right, about golf. Ooh, that's a that's a good one. So any thoughts of why someone who golfs with stenosis would have one-sided greater trochanter pain um, or pain in that region? Um, it might be the force. I'm certainly not a golfer, um, but it could be um, the force and the pressing into where you might get um, a little bit of kind of an overused feeling, maybe not so much on one side, depending on, again, how much mobility there is in the hips and the spine. But as you're going to the follow through is something happening where maybe they're putting some pressure into the hip this direction. That's something that might um, might be happening, making sure that um, even doing simple things like staggering the stance. So if you know somebody needs to really hit the ball far, you might open up their back, their foot a little bit to the back. So when they come through, right, they're coming into their swing, there's not as much restriction, right? If my front my leg is forward here, I can't move quite as much and restricted. It's kind of the same when we're choosing um, which leg to go in front on something like the, the spine twist or lateral flexion on the barrel or something like that. So good question. All right. Now I wanted to show one more thing. And this again is something that um, I first did with Sherry Betts. And one of the things that we want, again, like I mentioned in the beginning, the movement or the exercise that we're doing is often not the problem. Um, I think of things like reverse abdominals or quadruped exercise on the reformer, where we're going into hip flexion and extension. And if the person can do it well, we're not going into any excess extension, so it should be fine. But where's the mistake? So if somebody is going to, you know, in just the normal learning process, accidentally extend their spine, we need as teachers to be mindful of that and make sure we're setting them up for success. I'm not going to teach them to tuck, but I'm going to make sure that I'm watching that they are moving at the hip joint. They really have good disassociation and they're not moving their spine inadvertently. So this is another one of those. So we think of 
introducing um, extension with the assisted swan on top of the chair. And because we want to assist our clients, we put their legs on the trap table. So you have somebody who has maybe less hip mobility or at least awareness, you know, than we want. They have pretty poor trunk awareness, especially around the lower part of their spine. And they have poor thoracic mobility. And then we're asking to climb through those upright bars that are at the end of the table. Sometimes we leave the handles on the chair and this poor person is crawling out to then put their hands on a moving surface. That's a lot. <laughs> and maybe you've never thought about it that way, but if you watch somebody, um, it, it's quite a lot to do. So Sherry, I don't know if Sherry came up with this, but this is certainly who I learned it from, is have your chair, no handles, and allow the person to walk up to the chair. They can use their hands here. I've seen people even put a box or something here to put the knees on, and then they can lower themselves onto the box or onto the top of the chair. And you can see how in my lumbar spine, it's lengthened and my pelvis is just hanging down. My knees are just hanging in space. And then I can put my hands onto the pedals and now I can work on a little bit of thoracic extension. And again, the extension might not actually go into extension, just less flexion. And I can do my scapular work. I can take the dowel out and do rotation and all of those things. And then they can stand back up and off they go. So just some, some things that are helpful to in getting people into position. Another um, kind of helpful movement, and I know we're getting um, short on time here, is the idea of putting something behind the knee to help work on hip disassociation. And you think, well, we're not going into extension, it's probably fine. Um, but if you have a little ball, this is, happens to be a Franklin ball, but you could use any small ball between the back of the calf and the back of the hamstring right behind the knee. And this is a wonderful way to start making sure that the hip flexors are working without so much of the quadricep working. And if you try it, if you're just where you are and you want to grab a shoe or something or, you know, take your socks off and roll it up and put something behind the knee, as you do this leg arc, it starts to have a very, very different feeling where a lot of times people are also contracting the quad and you'll see they're like straighten or it'll straighten as they go down. This keeps everything close to center, easy to manage, and it takes away the quadricep part of it so they can really work on starting to get the hip flexor to be responsive and a good amount of mobility in the hip. Now, I didn't have a ladder girl today and quite honestly, <laughs> I tried to take one from Brent's today um, but I couldn't get it into my car. So I thought I might have a ladder barrel. I was just going to sneak it out the back and, and bring it home with me. But I'll show it on the ball. And this is the swan on the ladder barrel. So just kind of use your imagination. I'm going to move my camera a little bit up um, so you can see the whole thing. But I want to show a modification where you can do a seemingly inappropriate exercise appropriately. And a lot of this, I actually learned some of this um, from Beth Planet, who teaches with us in Miami, a full star educator, and um, a few other different people. And looking at the importance of knee flexion and just general trunk control. So if you are unfamiliar, there's a ladder back here with places you put your feet and this big curved surface, which is called the ladder barrel. So as I stretch forward, right, my feet are against the ladder, my upper body is down. This is a great position, comfortable stretch. And then as I come up, what I want to get to is to the place where somebody's body is in neutral, their thighs, and of course the ball is going to move around, but in the ladder barrel, this doesn't change. My thighs are glued and pressed into the ladder barrel. And the main thing that I'm doing is simply bending my knee to come up and to come down. And again, it looks a little different because I'm not on the barrel. But those of you that teach 
Swan and the Ladder Girl, think about that. When you get your client to this long diagonal position, instead of thinking, I'm going to extend my spine now, keep the spine in neutral and bend your knees more and you'll bring the body up. So they're standing here, they're upright. It's the same position that they might be in in standing, but now they're up on the barrel suspended in the air with the knees not touching anything. It is a wonderful feeling for people who think that they can't do these types of exercises. So you have to work at it and take some conditioning. You can't just get somebody into the position right away and into this movement, but it is possible. And the, um, the joy that people get from doing movements like this, who've been told you can't arch, you can't do these things. It's amazing. So their feeling of joy just goes, um, goes off the, off the charts. Um, so there's just a couple things. I know we're just coming into time. Ah, good. Nicole, Nicole just said she did it and it feels wonderful. Yay. <laughs> Susan. All right. So Susan's asking about improving hip internal rotation or giving internal rotation exercises as a prep for hip extension. Um, sure. And the whole idea of the bone rhythms, we were talking about the bone rhythms of going into flexion, but when you are going into hip extension, the relative bone rhythm is an internal spiral. So working on that would be great. Um, you can do a lot of the hip mobility exercises where you might first, and I'll face just so you can see my legs, but just a normal quadruped position. The feet can, and legs can be wide, you can turn out, you can sit back and forth this way, then parallel, then eventually internal rotation. And it's not really a child's pose as much as it is a stretching and again, opening of the pelvic floor muscles and the um, deep hip muscles. And so things like that are quite helpful, even things over doing some hip mobility that way. So those are some things that you could do to get into that position um it's really helpful good all right let me see if there's anything else before we wrap it up today yeah just a couple more people asking about golf and you know how much um there's a lack of hip movement it's really true so the more you can condition the hip joint um in all the positions really important um thoracic extension or thoracic rotation is huge for that population so that's really good. All right. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for joining today. It was really fun to talk a little bit more about um, how to do some extension and work with people who are just having our normal aging stenosis. I'm sure we'll, we'll all be there <laughs> at some at some point. Um, so again, just to wrap it up, work on mobility before you need it, right? Work on it with your young people, work on it with everybody that's coming through. Are you really getting the movement where you think you want it and where it should be? Develop your eyes a little bit more. Work on getting it throughout the whole body and then how can you modify to allow movement to happen away from those places where you have discomfort? And that's pretty much with any different pathology. All right, everybody, well, have a great rest of your Thursday. Uh, and we will see you very soon on the next Pilates Hour. Take good care, everybody.